Okay, we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 21, verses 15 to 36. After this, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also went with us and brought us to Nansen of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to stay. When we reached Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters welcomed us warmly. The following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard it, they glorified God and said, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there were who have believed, and they were all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to live according to our customs. So what is to be done? They will certainly hear what you have, hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have made a vow. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, and pay for them to get their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that what they were told about you amounts to nothing, but that you yourself are also careful about observing the law. With regard to the disciples who have believed, we have written a letter containing our decision that they should keep themselves from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. So the next day, Paul took the men, having purified himself along with them, and entered the temple, announcing the completion of the purification days when the offering would be made for each of them. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, fellow Israelites, help. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people, our law, and this place. What's more, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city stirred up and the people rushed together. They seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. As they were trying to kill him, Word went up to the command of the regiment that all Jerusalem was in chaos. Taking along the soldiers and centurions, he immediately ran down to them. Seeing the commanders and soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander approached, took him into custody, and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing and some another. Since he was not able to get reliable information because of the uproar, he ordered him to be taken into the barracks. When Paul got to the steps, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd, for the mass of people followed yelling, get rid of him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Maria. All right, good morning. Good morning and welcome to church. I want to take this opportunity uh, to ask Ronnie. Where's Ronnie? Ronnie's outside. So he convicted anybody about leaving the service. He's gone and snuck outside. <laughs> I actually didn't realize you're outside, Ronnie. But why are you at church today, Ronnie? To glorify God. To glorify God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. To glorify God. <laughs> um, well, we are uh, here in Acts carrying on. Um, as we head towards Easter, um, but uh, I think just before we uh, move into, uh, into the passage, uh, into the sermon this morning, uh, it's just something I want to say to you as, as a church. Over the last couple of years, um, ministry has, has been challenging and been difficult, as, uh, as maybe you might imagine or you might know, and uh, we, we see and we hear of guys uh, falling away from the ministry um, fairly regularly, because uh, it has been hard. But I want to say this. Ministering here at Emmanuel has been a joy. Um, and it is because of Jesus Christ, ultimately front and center, but 
I also just want to thank you, the church. You guys, through all the challenges, have made it a tremendous joy. Um, you're a gift to the church, and I thank God for how he is using you uh, as part of this church uh, to glorify him and to encourage uh, me as a pastor, not just me, but the rest of the ministry team. Um, so I just want to encourage you, continue to seek him, uh, continue to live for his glory as Ronnie has answered this morning. Um, and man, how much of a testimony uh, that is. Now, uh, over the last few weeks, uh, as we've been uh, moving along through Acts, uh, Paul, or we've heard a lot about Paul and, and the danger that he's heading to, to uh, the danger that he's going to experience as he heads towards Jerusalem. Uh, and today, we see this actual reality begin to unfold. Um, and, you know, just as we push into that, I want to encourage you, don't, don't just skim over this. Don't forget this. Don't just see this uh, as just another uh, reality of God's Word coming true. This is an example, or it's a lesson, in fact, uh, of God showing that whoever reads this, that he is always true to his Word. Always true. In other words, that you can depend on it. You can depend on it. Not just an exercise for Paul, uh, but a truth for every single one of us to be able to trust in uh, and know and understand. Now, something else uh, that we've uh, also seen, as we've carried along in Acts, we've seen this gospel go out. Uh, in other words, literally seen it advance. As Paul travels along through uh, the Gentile countries and missions, him along with uh, other apostles and church planters, they've uh, planted churches. We've seen sermons preached explaining the gospel advancing it. Uh, and one could think of this, or might think of this as uh, possibly the offensive tactic uh, of the reality of the gospel. In other words, where the gospel goes on the offense to be able to see it uh, advance. And we can think of missionaries uh, and, you know, evangelistic events in the same way. That's uh, what we have the Easter egg hunt planned for, not just to be a fun time for our kids, uh, but to advance the gospel, to lead to gospel opportunity and, and, and conversation uh, over Easter to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, you know, you, you might even think of it going on the offensive uh, like battles, so to say, taking the battle to the evil one, knowing that Jesus has told us that it is finished, the battle is won already. Uh, and we've seen Paul, not only as an apostle and a pastor, but do this uh, as, an, uh, as a missionary, and he does it well. But it's here at this stage in the book of Acts, chapter 21, where we've come from seeing a lot of offensive gospel development, gospel going out. And from here on, where we, for the most part, we're going to see the gospel shown in a very much defensive way. We'll see the defensive nature of the gospel. We'll see Paul defend uh, the gospel. Nowadays, we might know it as an apologetic. Uh, that's the term that we use within the church. Uh, and this is timely, because in many senses, we, as Christians, as believers, as the church, we need to know how to not only defend the gospel, but how to account for our faith. The Bible tells us that. And the way that it brings us to live. Because that's where we are moving towards today. Now, you see, uh, as Ronnie prayed uh, this morning, there are many Christians around the world today who are literally being persecuted for their faith, uh, who are losing uh, livelihoods, who are jailed, losing even having their lives threatened because of their professing faith in Jesus Christ. Now, the thing is, uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me that we know we're not there today. Okay, we're not there today. We live in relative freedom of being able to worship and gather and uh, open the Bible together, uh, you know, to send it out over the internet even. Uh, and we want to thank God for that. We don't want to take that for granted. We don't want to waste or, 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 you know, miss these opportunities that God has given us. But I'm... Um, for many of us, while we're not being physically persecuted, it is clear that there is a form of hostility towards the Christian faith that we're experiencing. See, we can ask, how are we supposed to live, not where we're being thrown into jail because of our faith, but more and more where we're being left out, or where we see the gospel or the Christian faith being misrepresented. See, many times the way I'll hear others talk about Christianity and what we believe, uh, I'll, I'll hear them say, or, or, you know, talk about some of uh, what we stand for as Christians, uh, and 
the way they understand is not only incorrect, sometimes it's, it's crazy. Sometimes it's ridiculous. The way our views of sexuality and marriage are, are, are misrepresented. Often not only untrue, but they're often twisted uh, and broken, completely misrepresented. Uh, and in that light, you know, we often see Christianity, we often see the gospel understood as a threat to the broader purpose of society. Do, do I make sense in terms of what I'm, what I'm saying here today? See, for the most part, while we're not living in a time of physical persecution, more and more and more we're seeing that the Christian faith, the faith that we stand on, seems to be getting in the way of the broader purpose of society. And so we might ask, how do you live when your belief system is starting to become a hurdle to society? Not being persecuted now, but it's clear that things are different to how it used to be. Now here today, and as I said, moving on through Acts, Paul's defense of the gospel will help us understand that, will help us understand how we're meant to live in this environment where we're seen, or our faith uh, is seen at the very least is, might be seen as odd, and at the most is seen as a hurdle to progress for society, the dominant belief system of our day. So Paul arrives in Jerusalem, uh, and on the second day that he's there, he goes to James, Jesus' half-brother, uh, the leader uh, of the elders of the Jerusalem church. And he starts telling them about all that God has done for the Gentiles uh, that he's been ministering to. Verse 19, after greeting them, he reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So we know that Paul knew that he would be walking into difficulty in Jerusalem, right? Right? Over and over again, the Holy Spirit's been prompting Paul, been telling him, this is what is going to happen through the prophecy that we saw last week. And when you might think that the first thing he might do as he gets to Jerusalem is to start to make provision for the struggle. I don't know, you know, maybe in the form of legal counsel or, or um, railing help, whatever it might be. Paul doesn't go do that. What does he do? He heads to the church and he starts telling them about all that God has done. So the first way that we see the gospel is defended is by telling others uh, of the good news that it brings. Firstly, we see and remember that the good news, the gospel, the good news always brings good news. Paul, James, and the elders are encouraged by God's grace uh, and faithfulness as the gospel's gone out on the offensive. Uh, verse 20 tells us that they heard it uh, and that they glorified God. But it's important for us to remember when facing challenges or difficulties because of the reality of the gospel, because of the good news of Jesus Christ, is that you can always look back and see what God has done. You can always look back and be reminded of His grace and continuing faithfulness and praise Him for it. See, that's why we share testimonies here in church. Never to make much of ourselves, but as a reminder of God's faithfulness. Now here at Emmanuel, it's not always just personal testimony, but we've seen the gospel move and shape and change lives in many different ways. Just this morning, you know, Laura shared some of the tremendous work. Not that, that you know, Laura or the volunteers are doing, and they do tremendous work out at Nseeker. But just... She's testified to the tremendous work that the Lord is doing. Every week, you know, at that adult Bible study, uh, as she said, that we get to experience, there are more and more, there are new faces each week, others coming back, returning. And it's been amazing to see how God's Word is shaping and convicting the lives of those ladies and uh, now a few younger folk in that art in, in the Keicher Township. It's not just in Sikha. Reach restoration. I thank God as I look around the room here today, there are some men in this room who I can call brothers in Christ because God has used their time through reach restoration. And it goes on and on and on. Just this last week, a guy that I've kind of been engaging with and reading the Bible with for the last few weeks messages me to say, Andre, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I have repented. I'm alive. That is great news. That is great news. 
And we see that over and over and over again. Stories of salvation and provision here within the church. And friends, this is not ever just a feel-good exercise. You see, these regular reminders of God's work and faithfulness are one of His gifts to us. If you're struggling with that right now, well then just start, you know, go back. Think of your salvation. Think about what God has done. That amazing thing, bringing you from death to life. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, in hindsight and gospel perspective, you'll see that God has been faithful to you ever since ever since. You see, I also want to remind you that God's faithfulness and His good good works go back way before you and I. God's Word tells us that over and over and over again. God is good just because He is God. God is good because of the air that we breathe here today. God's goodness is seen in the world that He has made. And man, if you want to find, you know, just remind yourself over and over and more and more that, you know, go Go to his word, Psalm 136. That's where I regularly go to for that reminder. It's not just a reminder, you see. We we, we see here from the greater context, we're also reminded that it's a physical reality seen in the church. Remember how Paul's uh, purpose for heading to Jerusalem was to deliver the collection that was taken from the Gentile churches to take it to the Jews who were struggling in Jerusalem. And Romans 15, not here, but Romans 15 tells us of, of, of Paul delivering the collection. So we see that it's not just, you know, it's not just salvation experience as such, but the reality of that salvation experience shows us that it's a physical reality, a reminder of God's goodness over and over and over. Now at this stage, we see the reality of this challenge against Paul begin to rise. James and the elders... Once Paul has told them about all that God has done in and around Asia, tell Paul about the challenges. You see, brother, they say, how many thousands of Jews there are who have believed and they are zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to live according to our customs. Now, it's important to remember this is not the first time Paul's come up against this, and we've seen this a number of times uh, through Acts, an ongoing issue where uh, many Jews, Christian Jews, who are zealous for God's law, go to the Gentiles, uh, and they start teaching Gentile converts that Jesus saves, but that to be a Christian, you then have to go on and keep uh, the Jewish uh, purity laws uh, and so forth. Now, we don't have time to, you know, to really uh, press into that, but we remember that Paul addressed this with James uh, and with the Jerusalem council. In fact, uh, there's a reminder here, verse 25, uh, James tells what they, uh, tells us, or Luke records what what James tells those Gentiles, that they don't have to legalistically keep the law, but that there is some wisdom in living with Jewish Christians. So to abstain, you know, from... Uh, eating blood, to abstain from sexual immorality. There are wisdom aspects. There are love of brothers and sisters, of respecting those who are Jewish and still live according to their culture. But at no point, at no point did and would Paul ever have taught any Jews or anyone for that sake to ever forsake Moses and the law. See, Moses, the law of God, finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And we know that. But because of that, we also know that Paul would never advocate to just do away with that. But you see, that's how the rumor spreads. There's an old Eastern proverb or or, or legend which tells of a young lady who happens to hear one day just a, a kind of a half story that a neighbor's telling or a conversation from a neighbor. And she goes on to assume the rest of the story, to assume some serious developments in her neighbor's life. So she goes on and she tells others in her town or a community, and before she realizes it, rumors have spread. After a short time, the young lady, realizing she's been the cause of false rumor, knowing that she's hurt her neighbor, goes to a local wise man or to a local sage, you know, in that Eastern culture, 
and asks for some advice. And so this old man, wise man, tells her to go to the market to buy a chicken, to have it killed, uh, and then as she walks home, to slowly pluck the chicken and throw the feathers out on the path as she gets home. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but she, she does it. And the next day, she arrives to tell that sage that she did all that he instructed. So he says, good, now go retrace your steps, your steps and collect all those feathers and bring them back to me. After searching all day, that young lady looking for those feathers, she comes back to the sage just with a handful of what she originally threw out. And she said, this is all I could find. Wise man says, you see, it's easy to drop them, but impossible to bring them all back. It's easy to drop them, but impossible to bring them all back. See, just like the feathers, it doesn't take much to spread a false rumor. But the reality of false rumors is you can never completely undo the hurt. Once it's gone, it's gone. Now, that's a bit of Eastern wisdom. And I'm sure we're all aware of the dangers of rumors or, or false representation. See, it's a clear reminder for us of the danger of that, to stay away from that, not to get involved in, in, in Skinner or gossip uh, or rumors. But what we see here is we see the result of that taking hold and leading to Paul's own struggle. We see that that rumor literally leads to a mob, to leading to him beaten up and being uh, guys wanting to kill him. All of Jerusalem, verse 31, being in chaos. Uh, and Luke even tells us again, verse 34, that some are shouting one thing uh, and others another. And so we just see the reality of this, this reminder that uncertain truth is dangerous. And friends, that's not just something for Paul back in that day. No, I think maybe now more than ever, we've seen the effects of that. Uncertain truth is dangerous. If you are not sure that it's true, don't get caught up in spreading that message. So two ways that Paul responds to this situation that will help us today. You see, after being told about the zealous Jewish Christians, secondly, we see gospel-motivated action. Paul listens to the church leaders, and he agrees to help four Jewish Christian brothers complete a Nazarite vow, which involves his own purification. And along with them, with this vow, means that they would present an offering uh, at the temple. Now, let's be clear on this. James and Paul, or James asks Paul to pay for the animals, for their sacrifice. And by Paul uh, listening to this request, or fulfilling this request, Paul shows that he never objects, never objected to Jewish converts following Jewish customs. Paul's issue is not the Jewish culture, per se, or any other culture, in fact. You see, as long as the gospel wasn't compromised, and, you know, those customs weren't required of those new Gentile believers, Paul did it for the sake of his brothers and sisters. See, Paul was putting feet to his words in Corinthians. He wrote uh, in his first letter to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians, 9, verse 19, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19 to 21, saying, Although I am free from all and not anyone's slave, talking about the freedom that he and uh, every and any believer has in Jesus Christ, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, in other words, to Gentiles, I became like one without the law, though I am not without God's law. See, Paul's not talking about doing away with the law, but under the law of Christ, the one who fulfills that law, to win those without the law. A few verses later, verse 23, 1 Corinthians 9, he says, I do this because of the gospel. I do this because of the gospel. You see, Paul's passionate about God's glory. He's passionate about the unity of the church and the evangelizing of all people. He's literally willing to do anything for the sake of the gospel as long as it doesn't compromise it. 
Friends, Paul offers us a powerful picture, a powerful picture of Christian liberty in this passage. See, he shows us spiritual maturity even when it comes at a cost. So what's one of the most important ways to, we respond towards misrepresentation or, or, or differences within the church and without? Well, we don't start by walking off and saying, well, that's my right, you know? Take it or leave it. That's what I'm going to do. No. Wherever it doesn't involve gospel compromise, even when it's costly, one moves into the cultural issues, into the cultural differences to lead towards a unity that is found in Jesus Christ. Friends, remember the mob that we're going to look at now? That was non-Christians. This was a church issue. This was a church thing. We never compromise the gospel. We don't ever willingly uh, you know, partake in sin to win people. But we must be careful of conveying the impression that everyone in the church and out must first be like us before they take Jesus seriously. We've got to be careful of that. See, Paul doesn't use his freedom to separate and to divide. He uses his freedom to move towards, to show the unity that is found in Christ, and ultimately to show how God is glorified through that. Friends, that's a reminder for each of us today. It's a reminder for each of us today. See, the world is hostile in many ways to the Christian faith because of the differences that we profess. We've got to be careful that we don't react in the same way within the church. Okay, Jesus Christ, authority of Scripture, the reality of who God is, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and many more realities are non-negotiables. We don't ever compromise on those and on the gospel. But if it is not a primary issue, then we move towards one another. Now, the third reality of what God shows us here this morning is one that the Bible is completely honest about and one that we've seen over and over again in Acts, and we're going to touch more on this next week, so we're not going to spend too much time here. But thirdly, we see the relationship between costly gospel faithfulness and false perception. Now, the mob at this stage, later on uh, in, in, in the passage that we've read this morning, this mob moves... Uh, and now other Jews come in on it. Not Jewish Christians, but other Jews who are, are simply zealous uh, for their law and for Judaism. Angered about what they heard about Paul. And they literally and physically become hostile. And we see that a lot of this comes from perception. Verse 28 and, and 29. Tells us because Paul arrived with Trophimus, a Gentile, they just assumed that Paul would take him past the court of the Gentiles into the temple, which... You know, which would be disrespectful and would be wrong. But assumption, and friends, this is where this matters for us. Assumption is the danger here. And what we see here is that this teaches us, in fact, it encourages us, that this will happen where the gospel is lived out, where the gospel is taught, where lives are changed and lived out. False perception will lead to hostility. You know, and God is always honest with us. Might be challenging. Might be challenging. But there is a positive reality to this. Let's have a look at some similarities here. Luke, same Luke, writing Acts, is also the one who wrote Luke's gospel. And he tells us how those Jews, or the, how that mob, tried to kill Paul. Verse 36, they shout, away with him. With Jesus Christ, the one who brings the good news, Luke tells us it was much the same. Luke 23, verse 20 and 21. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate, the governor, addressed the angry mob again. And that mob, that crowd, they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. You see, even under the guise of religious zeal, the world is hostile hostile to the good news of the gospel. And friends, 
God shows us that reality because when we're faced with it, it should not come at any surprise because that's the reality of sin in the human heart. See, Luke tells us about this angry mob. Have a look, verse 30. They seize Paul, and they literally drag him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. Now, the reality of the temple, the role that the temple played in Jewish culture, as you might know, is that that is the place. That is the place where you go to commune with God. The temple was the place where God dwelt in the midst of his people. Now, we thank God that through Jesus and his fulfillment, we don't have to go to a physical place. We have it. But you see, what we're being shown here is the reality of sin. See, the reality of sin inhibits that worship. Paul was pulled out of the temple and the gates were shut. But friends, the reality of the gospel is completely the opposite to that. Do you know that word for dragged out in verse 30? Where the mob drags Paul out of the temple is the same word that Jesus describes how God drags us in. John's Gospel, John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him in, and I will raise him up on the last day. Same word. Same word. Completely different action. See, the reality of sinfulness of our hearts without the good news of the gospel is we are hostile. We are hostile towards God. We drag ourselves away from the worship of the one living true God. We drag ourselves away from eternal life. We drag ourselves away from living a life that we've truly been made for, created for, and designed for. And what does God do? God pulls us in. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. Friends, that is the good news of the gospel. And while it is hostile to the world, and while it is misrepresented time and time again, We can draw encouragement from that. See, the good news is that if you know Jesus Christ, God has brought you in. And no matter how much heartache, no matter how much resistance, no matter how much untruth we we might experience, and it's on the rise, no doubt, we can face that because we know we have been brought in. Not because we deserve it, not because of our religious zeal, not because of our ethnic culture, or whatever it might be, but because that is who God is. No one can come to Him. No one can come to the Father unless He has been draw, drawn in. That is what God does. We don't have to prove ourselves. We don't have to be more religious. We don't have to show more zeal but he draws us in so that we can be in eternal communion with the living God, never to have those temple gates shut. Friends, that is why and how the gospel moves us to transform culture. That is how the gospel will continue to move us to live in a time of misrepresentation. That's why we can expect hostility, but that's how we can have hope in the midst of it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that even when your word is brutally honest about the struggles of life in this world, about how we on our own will resist you and run from you, Father, we thank you that you are that gracious God who has sent his Son, who comes to us and draws us in. And so, Father, in the face of that, Lord, we bow down and we worship and we praise you. We thank you for that good work that we've seen in Jesus, not just once off, 
but through that once for all penalty that you have paid for us. Because you have forgiven us, Lord, that we can live lives even though we experience hostility and struggle today, Lord, knowing that we have been brought in and knowing that your promise is always true, knowing that you will never leave or forsake us, Father. So our prayer is that you help us to live boldly knowing that. Lord, help us to live boldly knowing that you are not only with us now, but to eternity. Help us to live boldly knowing that when we do, when we are persecuted, when we are misrepresented, Lord, that you are with us, that your word is certain, that your presence is sure. And Father, by the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord, you will continue that good work until we are in glory with you one day. Father, may that be a truth which continues to shape our church. May that be a truth which continues to strengthen us for life in this world, though we are not citizens of this world. And may that be a truth that we continue to look to over and over again because of who you are. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name.